Okay, so we're going to follow the example here of Jack and Jill and talk about how Jack and Jill can produce eggs and sperm and how these cells of eggs and sperm are very different from the rest of the cells that are produced during the process of mitosis. So recall that you know all of their body, every single cell in their bodies can reproduce through the process of mitosis and the goal is to produce from one cell two identical daughter cells. The only exception to that are the cells that are found in the ovaries and in the testes. And the cells that, we're gonna, that are produced in the ovaries and the testes are the gametes or the sperm and egg. And, and this happens through the process of meiosis. So this is a little bit different. So we're going to examine this process. But again, the point is that Jack and Jill, who are going to have sexual reproduction, need to produce cells that now have half as much of the genetic DNA, right, of the DNA, in order that when these cells come together, the amount of DNA is right back up to the normal amount. And to keep track of this, one way we do this is to talk about the N number. And for multicellular diploid organisms, we can use this, this type of notation, 2N for an organism that has paired chromosomes. Right? And so our 2n, or our paired number of total chromosomes, is 46. And that is what the, all of the cells in the adult body, all of the autosomal cells are. And that is what the initial cell, before it goes through meiosis, um, the, ga the cell that's going to become a gamete, before it goes through meiosis is also a 2n equals 46 cell. But when after the process of meiosis is done, the sperm and egg cells now have half the amount of DNA and so they are now an N cell or a haploid cell. And so they are N equals 23. They only have 23 chromosomes. Then when the egg and sperm come together in fertilization, once again it, it, this, the cell becomes a diploid cell and at this point we call it a zygote. Once a, an, an egg is fertilized by a sperm, it's called a zygote and it now has once again a 2n equals 46 and then that cell goes just through mitosis, mitosis, mitosis and development and differentiation until eventually you form a full individual again. So we need to then learn more about this process of meiosis. And the way to think about this is we're going to simplify this. Instead of using 23 pairs of chromosomes, we're going to start with just one pair of chromosomes. So here we have one pair of homologous chromosomes. And you can think about it that originally, you know, the red chromosome perhaps came from the mother and the, the blue chromosome came from the father of, of the person whose who's these cells are, right? The chromosome then must first duplicate, or I'm sorry, the cell must first duplicate all of the chromosomes. And so the chromosomes get duplicated. And this occurs in the interphase of the cell cycle. So this is even before my, mitosis or meiosis has occurred. It's the same in, in all cells. Duplication of the DNA occurs during interphase in the S phase of interphase or synthesis phase. And then you now have still two chromosomes. We don't have four chromosomes here. These, these chromosomes that were duplicated are still connected together and so there are still only two chromosomes here but double the amount of DNA from from this original point and we call these chromosomes that have now been uh, doubled right in, the, in their amount of DNA they're called sister chromatids so each part of those is called a sister chromatid but we still have the homologous pair of duplicated chromosomes then the cell is now ready to go through meiosis and meiosis has two stages, meiosis 1, meiosis 2. In meiosis 1, homologous chromosomes separate. Now this is crucial to remember this. In meiosis 1, homologous chromosomes separate. So when these chromosomes line up, they line up such that when these chromosomes are pulled from side to side, the red chromosomes that it has its du that is doubled, right? It's a, it's a duplicated chromosome goes one way and the blue chromosome goes the into the other cell. So at this point, we now have an N, or haploid, cell. So when homologous chromos chromosomes separate, you immediately now have the haploid condition. But then, 
in meiosis, there is a second cellular division. And in the second cellular division, called meiosis II, sister chromatids separate. Now that should sound familiar because that's what happens in mitosis. In mitosis, you start off with a, with a full diploid cell, it doubles its DNA, and then it just goes through one cell division and becomes uh, you know, an, ide an identical cell to the original one, and sister chromatids separate in, in mitosis. That's all that ever happens. But in meiosis, it's in meiosis II that sister chromatids separate. So meiosis II is very much like mitosis, except that you start with a haploid cell. And then you end up with four haploid cells from one original cell. Now I want to look in, in to detail at meiosis I and meiosis II very quickly. So in meiosis I, it also has the same stages that are talked about in mitosis of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase and cytokinesis. But remember, in, in meiosis I, homologous chromosomes are going to separate. During prophase, the homologous chromosomes also come in close proximity and they actually exchange tips. So you get blue chromosomes with red tips and red chromosomes with blue tips. This is called crossing over or recombination. And the sites of crossing over are called these, are, are these sites here where the, the chromosomes kind of, they cross over and then they're able to exchange and kind of swap tips. Um, that, form, that whole formation is called a tetrad. Then these chromosomes, which have now swapped tips, move along the midline such that one homologous chromosome is ready to go one direction and one homologous chromosome, the other homologous chromosome is ready to go the other direction. And then homologous chromosomes are separated. Okay? And then you have telophase and cytokinesis and now you have formed the two haploid cells. In meiosis II, where we're starting off already in the haploid condition, this is very similar once again to mitosis because the, the chromosomes line up along the midline where each sister chromatid is getting ready to separate and to go into each part, each opposite end of the cell. And as soon as those sister chromatids separate, you can now consider those sister chromatids being now their own chromosomes. And so now they are their, their, their own full chromosomes. And so you end up then with four haploid cells, um, each having a half set, right, of, of the initial DNA amount. Because of this, during my, the meiosis one and meiosis two, you have different possibilities of how these chromosomes can line up. For example, you could have a blue chromosome on the left and a, a big blue on the left and a little blue on the left, a big red on the right and a little red on the right. And when these are separated during meiosis I, you're going to separate your homologous chromosomes and so you're going to end up with all blues here and all reds here. And so the ultimate, after meiosis II, you end up with a big blue, little blue, big blue, little blue, right? But another possibility for this system where we have only two pairs of chromosomes, so it's a 2n equals 4 um, situation, is that you could have had big blue on the left and little red on the left. So when these are then separated during meiosis I, you end up with a big blue and a little red and a big red and a little blue. And so your combinations are slightly different down below where you have combination C and combination D. So you can see in this very simple system of a two pairs of chromosomes, you can actually end up with four different kinds of gametes. Now this is important because this produces variation. This produces the lots of different kinds of eggs and sperm. And for a system where you only have two pairs of chromosomes, it's very easy to calculate. It's two to the two, which equals four different combinations. But for humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so it's two to the 23, which means you have 8,388,606 possible um, gametes. So there's lots and lots of possible gametes. This is why you never see you know, um, identical siblings from in from in um, two independent fertilization events. Obviously, identical twins can be identical, but that's one fertilization event. One egg, one sperm coming together, and then that initial zygote splits into two, and you get two individuals. But if you ever have two sperm and two eggs coming together, the possibilities, the probability of having exactly the same genetic combinations coming together is so remote that it never happens, particularly because humans don't have lots of babies. Furthermore, you must remember 
that crossing over is happening, right? We talked about this already, where you form the tetrads in meiosis one, and the crossing over sites, the, the chiasma or site of crossing over is happening, and so you end up with with blue chromosomes and with red tips and red chromosomes with blue tips. So now add on top of, of crossing over, which happens about 1.4 times per chromosome, you add that number of on top of the more than 8 million different possibilities and you've now expanded the number of possible gametes that are produced during meiosis in humans and in all other organisms that also carry out meiosis and, and produce eggs and sperm. And so sexual reproduction using the process of meiosis, creating this variation, uh, accomplishes the goal which is producing offspring that are a mixed bag of the parental traits, therefore allowing natural selection and, and evolution to see these variations and to work with them over time. So that's a quick video about our Jack and Jill who and how they produce gametes and how these gametes are different and how they end up being these haploid cells that they can then come back together to form zygotes which are much different than the parents.